Okay, let's get started. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Commander Events, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Darren, and I'm going to be your host. Um, before we start, I just want to quickly point out that this time we're using Zoom webinar um, instead of Zoom meeting. So the interface is a little bit different than what you may be used to. Um, there is a dedicated Q&A feature, which you can see on the bottom right of the screen. So please put your questions there during the talk, and you can also upvote other people's questions. Um, we'll get to them during our Q&A time. All right, our topic today is, as you can see, um, deadlines and estimations. What do I do with them? Um, we have a real treat for you this time because we have not just one, but two great speakers lined up, uh, Vitaly and Renee, who will each give a talk about this topic. Um, so I'm going to introduce Vitaly now, as he will share with us first. Uh, Vitaly, he is a developer advocate at Pace, and he has over 20 years of experience in the industry doing programming, leading, and mentoring teams. I think he's the perfect person to share about the why of deadlines and estimations from a manager point of view. So Vitaly, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Darren. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction. So yeah, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Hold on a second with everyone. Share screen. That's it. And here are my slides. So yeah, my talk is called The Rationality of Estimations. Why and why not estimate? Um, first, something about some info about me. I'm 37 years old and 20 years out of these 37, I've been in the industry. So it's pretty much the whole, whole my life. And I'm really passionate about doing proper stuff rather than doing some waste or muda, how they call it in Japan. And I've been doing 13 years of JavaScript, uh, then seven years of team leading and mentoring teams and teaching teams and consulting companies. And now I work as a developer advocate at Case. So my talk is about estimations. We are all used to seeing estimations and forecasts when we check what to wear, when we decide what to wear tomorrow, we check the forecast, the weather forecast. And the weather forecast is actually a prediction of some sort. And this forecast takes a huge, huge effort. Uh, here's K. K is one of the top 500 supercomputers. And pretty much every single supercomputer was built first or well, maybe one of the reasons why it was built uh, to serve as a number crunching machine for weather forecasting. Why that? So why spending so much effort and money and budget and time and everything on actually predicting weather? Well, actually because more accuracy, accuracy saves money. So if you're, if you're seeing, if your data showing that there is a hurricane or tornado or something else coming to the region where your cargo uh, ship is actually uh, in, chances are you won't let it go. You won't let it uh, into the hurricane or tornado. You will try to you will try to optimize the um, the route of the ship so it doesn't sink. Or you're just not going to be flying to a different um, continent if you see that the weather is bad. Or you won't send your jet or your plane to, to some, some area if you see the weather is bad, the conditions are bad. I think pretty much everyone experienced a delay in a flight due to weather conditions. So in some applications, forecasting is essential and critical. And there are even programs which are installed in some medical um, equipment, which are trying to forecast the condition, the medical condition of a client, of a sick person. And then you administer some different drugs or whatever. So what about the IT? We're all used to do estimations. We, I, I've never seen a team, pretty much never seen a team who didn't do, which didn't do estimations. And as I say, estimations is a forecast. We can't for sure say how much time it will take us to deliver a feature. The only proper data, the only proper information about the time, how much it will take us to do a feature, we, we can collect during the feature build process. So whenever we've done the feature, we know for sure how much it take. It took, it took us. And so I've actually made a huge poll in Russian IT asking why managers demanded estimations, why managers 
asked for estimations and forecasts from their teams. First reason is to see team load capacity. Second one is that public tender contract or governmental contract requires estimations. And then there are three reasons, um, quite strange, but mm, think they are put like that. Manager needs to know when a feature is to be done. Manager needs to understand how much a feature will cost. And manager needs to be able to choose between feature A and feature B depending on the cost. Actually, those five reasons, they boil down to three, to see team load or team capacity, uh, or when the company operates with government or some other body uh, which requires the estimation, or just manager wants to know the estimate for pretty much any reason. I'll talk later about it. So I've marked headers with red where I see that where I did, where I, where I think that estimations are not rational. Um, so whenever a manager asks estimations to see team load, he or she thinks that if team finishes tasks on time, maybe we can throw more. So managers tend to overload teams. That's quite quite a usual thing. Managers usually want to get as much return of investment on the team as possible. And I rarely see a manager knowing the philosophy, sorry, the psychology of labor or the ergonomics of labor, how actually our human body and mind operates under stress. Uh, so the science says that overload in labor, in intellectual labor is counterproductive. We've all been in situations where we are overloaded with work and we are struggling to pick a task to do. We're burned out. We can't think properly. We can't think rationally. And we're doing some bad coding then, bad decisions. It is interesting that load essentially does not equal to result. So in physical labor, we know if we chop wood, we will have enough wood chopped. Um, in intellectual labor, more we load, less is we get. So there is a fine line where load, where there's just enough load for us to process. And so if a manager looks at estimations as a measure to see if team is underperforming or can be loaded with more work, then the manager does a bad job for, for them. Uh, because once again, they are overloaded. The guys are overloaded and they will do less. So the recipe here is to actually do less rather than do more, but do less rationally. So if a product manager brings you 10 tasks, it's more optimal to decide a few of them of higher value and focus only on them rather than do 10 of them, all of them. So if, if you can talk to your manager to actually see what's of higher value for the client, it's better to do that instead of doing everything, hoping that the client will like everything. And there is also a recipe of redoing less. So there is this concept that auto testing, automated testing, takes the time, takes time and it costs a fortune. Well, actually not. We are testing our software in our head every time we compile it and every time we run it. So whenever a regression appears, if you write a test tackling this regression, you are saving yourself a lot of time. So later you will have to redo much less. Okay, tender contract, governmental contract. Client, the government or this body that requests an estimation from you, they know the value. So if it's a, let's say a rifle designed specifically, it is usually designed by a client. And the, so they know the characteristics of this rifle to actually work for them. So they will only bargain, they will only negotiate on the cost of the production. So then they will require, they will request an estimate, how much time and money it will take you to build this rifle or software. So if we look at this from the theory of constraint perspective, and I highly advise everyone to read it, Alt Schuller was a genius. Uh, sorry, not Alt Schuller, I can't remember the name of the inventor. Um, 
time constraint is an external one. So we have to expose our predictions and estimations on um, how much time it will take us to build the software to the client. And what's interesting that there is this huge body of knowledge, a PMI, Project Management Institute, which certifies project managers who are assumed to have enough knowledge to predict how much time the project will take to build. And yet PMI's, PMI's own information and statistics show that only 30% of projects run on time and on budget, which means that apparently this whole approach is not that efficient. But anyway, if you run governmental contract, you will have to predict how much time it will take you. And then you can apply any big methodology, waterfall methodology, they call it, to satisfy the requirement. And then the, the biggest one is, when will it be done? That's the question the managers love to ask. And my thesis here is that most often this information is not needed at all. Um, usual excuses or usual reasons why managers ask this question is that, oh, we are going to be having a marketing campaign on the 1st of January, uh, let's say, or on the 14th of Feb for the St. Valentine's Day, and we need to know for sure how much, how many features will be ready till then. There are interesting consequences of that, that the code quality will be get will, will 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 be much lower if we try to fit features till that date because we're going to be handling our constraint of time. Uh, but even more, why can't we just build something and then marketing campaign depend on us and advertise what we've built? Why can't we advertise only things that are ready? And why can't marketing team then just enable them using feature toggle on the server. So this situation where the IT department is depending on the marketing department is a status quo. Yes, we're all living in this scenario, but is it all right to have this? I'm not sure. And also managers sometimes say, okay, this is an external event. FIFA Cup uh, is gonna be, is gonna be uh, having our city uh, hosting the event. Fine, that might happen. But then how many times during your business life do external events like that, that that require estimations happen? Rarely. And if they happen often, maybe you should employ some different way of working with your IT department. So let's say fire brigade, a typical fire brigade has only 10% utilization. So well, firefighters sit on their desks, by their desk, nine hours out of one, just to be able to handle critical situations like that, an external event, a fire. So uh, if your line of business, if your business model, if your business whatever demands you to respond to critical events, maybe you should hire much more, maybe you should hire five times more for people not to be overutilized and then having no time to actually do anything. But maybe they can be just free most of their time so that whenever an external critical event happens, you will have enough time for them to respond. And then there is this even, even better one. How much does the feature cost? Managers love to ask this. So whenever we come, I have this good analogy. Whenever we come to a market, and here is a picture of tomatoes. We see tomatoes and we see the price. So first, we know the value of the tomato. We know the nutritional value of it. We know that we like the taste. We know that we want to consume it. We are sure of the value. And then we decide which tomatoes to buy, comparing the prices. So once again, we know the value and only then we pick uh, the good for the price. So if we didn't know what was there, would we, would, we, would we check any prices? If it's some blah, 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 said six pounds per box, would we actually compare the prices? If we don't know the value, we can't compare the price. And there is this good screenshot. Um, there, there are cases when people try to purchase something on the internet based just on the image of it, on the picture of it. 
So my roommate ordered a TV stand of Amazon. This is what came, a toy one. So the value is not obvious. You're just looking at the picture and you're buying it. And then you figure out that the, the, the thing itself is not suitable for your needs. There is another one that a nephew wanted a converse rucksack for school and the rucksack size was just fit for the cat. So why am I showing all this? Because we must first know the value and only then we check the price. What does it mean in IT? That if we don't have value forecast, value estimate, we should not do any cost, cost forecast or estimate. Let's see the example. It's very simple. So a product manager comes to us, says, okay, we have these three features, feature square, feature circle, and feature triangle. And feature square, he says, will estimate us a revenue of from 50 to 90K to $90,000. Feature circle will estimate us a revenue of 150 to 200 and triangle from 300 to 400. Then he asks us for estimation, for our cost estimation. So he wants us to find out how much time it will take us to build those features. And we provide the estimate. And I'm showing quite a good example of both products being able to forecast the estimate of a feature and us being able to forecast within a certain range of quality. So we say, we're saying that Square will take us from 10K to 40K to build, Circle from 15 to 30, and Triangle from 20 to, 20 to 24. So using this table, we can kind of understand that it seems to be obvious that we should run for Triangle feature. Because in the worst case scenario, it will yield us 10 times more than we spend. So what happens next? Reality strikes. Uh, so we see that Square actually yielded us only 90K, which is, which is good. It's uh, within the estimate the product provided. Cost uh, of Square feature was 13K, again, within our estimate. With circle, we got 200, that's good. Uh, cost still, still good, but triangle failed. Why it failed? Because the product estimated it wrong, wrongly. So uh, regardless of, our, I mean, it doesn't matter that we spend more time than we actually predicted we would spend on building it. The failure of the estimation lies in the revenue estimation in the value estimation so we could have spent i mean if the product estimation was correct we could have spent 10 times more money on building the feature and we would still be profitable with this feature so i'm here with this two imaginary example i'm showing you the value of the forecast on the product side so i think that it's very important for us to make sure that we optimize forecast of revenue, but not the forecast of cost. So once again, if we don't know the value of a feature, if the product team or product manager can't show a proven history of success in estimating the value of a feature, it doesn't matter if we do estimates on our side or not. And so if there is no revenue forecast, then we shouldn't do any cost forecast. If we can't see tomato it is or something else, we won't compare the prices. And what do we do with all this? Of course, we can become enemies with a product manager and tell him, mate, we won't show you any estimate on our side. I mean, if you don't show us estimates on your side, if it's your wild guess that this feature A will bring us this amount of clients or this amount of money. We're not estimating our work. But I always advise to become partners rather than enemies. So why do product managers or team leads demand estimations? Because they are in, I don't, I don't know, they, they are afraid, I think. They are afraid that they will be asked on return of investment in the team. They are afraid that they will be asked what's gonna happen with the features. 
So they don't know how intellectual labor works, that we can't predict things properly. And he can't, and the manager can't predict his work properly too, because we don't know if our feature actually will be liked by clients. We can do a certain amount of work to figure it out to a certain degree, but we don't know for sure if the clients will want this feature or not. There are plenty of startups going bust, going broke, just because they failed to understand the product fit of their business. So they came up with an idea, but the clients didn't want to pay for the result. They didn't want to pay for the product. And that's all right. But again, proper partner relationship means that we are equal in this situation. And so if the product cannot predict how much money or value the feature or the project or an epic or a story will bring, he has no rational reason to ask how much time it will take us. And yet again, partner, not enemies. Let's not just say we won't give you estimates. Let's try to figure out how to help him or her, help, help the manager. That we engineers can help the managers with technology that we have at hands. We can help him or them with A-B testing, with building something really, really, really small, like iterating within a few days only, sitting closer to the client. We, man we, we IT guys can ask a manager to give us a client representative contact and work with that client representative. That's why all that Agile and Scrum and all those um, frameworks were kind of invented for. Of course, they all now getting south where and uh Rene will talk about that as well <coughs> how scrum fails us sometimes but anyway we can iterate smaller we can help managers with their discomfort with their fear by showing how we work we can then work in small iterations ask to work closer to the client uh, deliver a b tests I mean, when I used to work in Badoo, for example, in huge dating, we ran very small fraction of users in our A-B test. We, we gave them new code. We saw how those users behaved with the code. And if it proved to be okay, if it proved to validate the product hypothesis that this new feature will actually succeed, we then ran it properly. We then coded it properly. We threw away the proof of concept work because it's proof of concept. The code is the code quality is bad, and we built proper features. Or, for example, same case in Badoo. I had mobile web team where we ran A/B tests, which then became hypothesis proper hypothesis for iOS and Android team. So before investing into costing a lot into something that's costing a lot, you can do it in a throwaway manner. And also from the estimation standpoint, you can use stats. That's what Kanban is all about. There is this huge area of Kanban um, statistical anal analytics, it's called, I think, where they show, they show that our team usually like 80 percentile, percentile uh, of features is done within two weeks. Is this information enough for most managers? For the financial planning, it's more than enough. So if we see that our team delivers on average, not on average, on like median percentile, 80 percentile uh, features is delivered within two weeks, management, top management can decide how many more teams we need. Uh, of course, nine, women can't give a birth to, to, to a kid in one month. Uh, there will be communication, synchronization costs, etc. Uh, but again, for the top management, analytics and statistics will be enough. So if we help the manager fight his or her discomfort and fear and show them how we can help them with the technology we have, with the processes we, we, can, we can invent, it might be beneficial for both the manager and the team because estimates, they have side effects. Rene will talk a lot about that. Uh, and I will just briefly say what I witnessed, that any estimation 
from IT or from products, from whoever in the company is always considered a promise, always and always. Whenever you say, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna build this in three days, you mean usually three working days it will take me to do the coding and maybe the testing as well, maybe the deployment as well. But then again, it's always perceived like in three calendar days, users will be using this new functionality, which is not always the case because you have other tasks, you have other duties, you might get ill, you might get hit by a truck, whatever might happen. So always estimations are considered to be a promise and promise then becomes a deadline. And if there is a deadline, then Goodhart law says that whenever you pick any measurable metric and use it in your management, that's the metric that the people will tend to hit rather than client's value to hit. So whenever you say lines of code should be more and more, you should like produce more lines of code, that's what you're gonna have. If you say client's value is the goal, then that's what you're gonna have. And so if you have team KPIs or team, mm, let's say, measured by how accurately they um, run estimations and how accurately they hit deadlines, that's what you're gonna get. You won't get client's value. You will get either people adding margin on top of every estimation to, um, to make sure they don't fail the estimations, they don't fail the deadlines, or you will have people burning out. And if people are burning out, science once again says that there is no proper intellectual labor under stress conditions. So deadlines hurt performance because people can't perform well under stress. It's like the proverbial uh, two week sprint. Every two week you have a stress of a deadline. And deadlines hurt quality because if you have someone really wanting to deliver on time, this person will decrease the quality of code even irrationally just to make sure, oh, I won't test this one, it's, it's obvious. Let's just deliver it to the client. We'll figure it out later. So deadlines do hurt quality. So again, estimations have to be done only when there is a proper value for the estimation, when you need to do this. And there is very low chance that a proper business will have a real need for the estimations. Because when you have them, chances are the problem is elsewhere. And with that, I think I'm done. I have my Twitter, Telegram, email, and GitHub. Feel free to subscribe or write or whatever with it. And I will pass, um, pass the, the, the talk to Rene, and he will talk a lot about the consequences of estimations. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Vitaly, for sharing with us. And I think it's really helpful how you organize the, the, the arguments for estimation and then kind of just dealt with them one at a time. Um, so I think we just have one question in the Q&A right now for, for Vitaly. And um, yeah, and don't, don't worry because we'll have a longer Q&A at the end after Renee shares with us. Um, yeah, so let me just um, read off the, the question that we got. So it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, it says, what should we do if managers keep pushing us on having a clear estimation? What sort of responses should we give them? Um, yeah, maybe Renee is going to touch on that later. But, but yeah, Vitaly, feel free to throw out some thoughts. Thank you for the question. It's, it's a great one. I could wrap it up as change your company or change your company. So, so you either try to change your manager or you just change the company. So I succeeded in cases like that when I built proper trustworthy relationship with my manager, showing him that I'm vulnerable, that I can fail, that I'm a human, and showing him that if he can open up to me, if he can explain why he needs this estimation, I might help, not with the estimation itself, but with the problem. Because, you know, there is this anecdote that someone is just looking um, under the 
electrical light looking for something. And another person asks, why are you looking? What are you looking for? He says, my keys, but where did you lose them? Oh, it's back there. But why are you looking here? It's lighter here. So uh, we shouldn't look for something where it's lighter. We should look for something where we lost it. So if a manager wants estimations, there is a reason for that. And if you, if you are able to build a relationship with a manager where you will understand what the reason is, maybe you can help with that reason. Saying that there are lost, I call them lost companies, companies which are unable to change because culture, company culture changes people a lot. It mm. does. So there are companies where something is so deeply rotten that you can't change it. And managers there just say things like, I'm telling you to give me the estimation. That's why you need to give it to me. Mm. So if you have a manager like that, leave. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the answer. Um, so yeah, as I said, we'll continue the Q&A at the end of the event. And you can continue to ask questions in the Q&A section. Um, but now, since we're moving to Renee's talk, like if you want to ask a question that's specific to either Vitaly or Renee, make sure you write down their names along with the question. You know, for example, like this is for Renee, this is for Vitaly, okay? Um, yeah, now I want to introduce our next speaker, Renee. Um, he has... He has had over 10 years of experience as a developer, and now he is a developer advocate at Ombury, um, focusing on the developer experience. He's going to share with us his personal experience um, dealing with estimations and deadlines and what he has learned from the, from the experience. Okay, so without further ado, I'm ready. I'm gonna give it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen here um, and we can get started. There we go. Um, all right, so how not to deal with estimation. That's the, uh, uh, the, the title here. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and share one of my experiences I had as a developer. Uh, but first, I want to introduce you to this quote from uh, Douglas Adams from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <clears throat> like, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing noise as they make, they make as they go by. Um, this is very typical in software development, um, and this should always take a deadline with a grain of salt. Um, but of course, as, as fitly explained, like that's not always how it works. Um, so first, who am I? My name is Rene Pot. I'm a developer advocate at, at Ambori. Uh, I've been a JavaScript developer for over 10 years, and I've started programming in, uh, well, First HTML, of course, but then PHP when I was 12. So overall, more than 20 years of experience as a, a developer, but professionally like 13 or something. Um, and you can find me at the, uh, the the nickname you can see there. It's Rodpik. It's uh, it's from a very obscure Frisian language that no one knows, uh, but I use it as a handle. So um, let me uh, let me start and let me tell you a story. Of, um, of my experience a couple of years back at a company where ironically, I didn't stay long uh, and you'll soon find out why. Um, so first, let's go to the conference room because everyone is going to have to estimate here. Uh, and that's, that's how our typical schedule was. And it was, a little, it was offset a little bit. So we started on Friday. So after the estimations, we had a weekend to, I guess, mull it over a little bit um uh, think about it um uh, so yeah my boss also took a little bit of the of the weekend time so i could after we did our estimations my head could go spinning and and prepare for the monday um but when i started at that company i was like okay I, I, this is like to give you a picture this is a startup uh, 20 people a couple developers some marketing people um uh, design team everything like they were just funded uh in an accelerator so it was like this the speed was high that's i mean that's the, the general gist of a of a startup i'm in a startup now but the speed is high too but it's much more relaxed even though the speed is probably higher than it was there and this is all due to uh the estimation cycle so fridays we've started sprint planning and the sprint planning typically looked like this um even though we were like five or six developers or something. Uh, we had probably a hundred different post-its, maybe more um, on, uh, on a board where everything, every task was split up into as many segments as possible. So 
each task was no longer than a couple hours. Like if it took more than four hours, split it up. Then we can see that we can distribute it, then we can keep track of it. And as I said, when I started, it was like, okay, I'm amazed here uh, how these people understand how to estimate and how to, to do things. So this is the trap I fell in, right? So Monday through, th through Thursdays, we had daily standups every morning, probably around 10. Um, I don't even remember the time it was, but it was, I'm guessing around 10. Um, we, we stood together in front of this board with 100, 100 post-its and everyone talked about the tickets that were in progress. Everyone talked about like the typical scrum things, blockers, uh, what are you going to do today? What did you do yesterday? Like those kind of things. Um, and, and this was probably the company that followed Scrum the, to the letter. Um, they did everything Scrum tells you to do. Um, and I thought, oh, this is cool. Everyone knows what they're up to. Uh, the design team knows what's happening. Uh, we know if we have blockers, like you name it. Everything was known. So daily standups, we talked about everything. Um, and yeah, that, that kept on going. Um, and it looked a little like this. <clears throat> And, but then um, um, our board was a little bigger than this. <laughs> Let's just say uh, a couple meters wide. Anyways, uh, this is how I felt. I felt very organized. I knew exactly what was happening. And uh, yeah, okay. So on Friday, we had, of course had another stand up. Um, and we had a, uh, a halfway check-in, like, are we on schedule or approximately half our tickets going to be moved to done and the end of this week um and, and and typically the answer was no no we had too many blockers um there's some tickets that kept hanging in the to-do list that uh, should have been done probably earlier so like how do we how do we handle this like what do we do uh, do we kick tickets out now or and, and so the halfway check-in was typically a, a two-hour meeting uh, about which tickets should be moved, which tickets should be should stay. Um, and, um, and, and often it was decided that uh, we should probably do more than we did this week. Right. Next week, we are going to focus more and make sure that we do the tickets that are necessary to deliver this feature at the end of the spring. And as Vitaly said, like, why do we have to deliver this at the end of the sprint? Well, that was something that was in the air. Um, so yeah, this is what, what our tickets turned into. Um, and not necessarily in the shredder. Now, usually they ended up on a pile that uh, were revisited in the next sprint planning, if they were removed, of course. So then Monday through Wednesday, the next week, we had our daily standups, daily routine, nothing changed compared to first week however uh, the pressure was higher because there were more tickets that were left than there should have been and then on the third on the on the last day of the sprint because we were offsetting by a week um we have um uh, the last day of sprint stand up so it was more like a a, a wrap up here and then uh, then at about four o'clock in the afternoon we had a retrospective we all sat together in a different room, discuss things casually, uh, told what went wrong, what went right, uh, you name it. Like all the things Scrum writes, all the Scrum things Scrum says you should do in a retrospective we did. Um, and if we made our sprint, then we would get a treat. Like, uh, uh, good job, you did this week well, uh, here's a uh, glass of whiskey, or here's a, uh, a nice, uh, a chocolate bar like like we were rewarded for making our sprint and uh, this was of course meant as an incentive to 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 deliver higher quality work and, and and go faster but of course you already know this is not the case uh i lost my mouse there we go so yeah sprint in a nutshell we missed it and and honestly in the in the in the period i worked there um we uh um, I I think I got like uh, one or two rewards, so you understand we we never met we never uh, made it really. And then we were Friday again, so things repeated again and again and again. So it's all Groundhog Day. Um, 
and and that's that's my typical that was my typical schedule and you think okay so this is great the company knows what we're up to uh tickets were removed halfway um everything went well like we communicated we probably even deployed on thursdays um uh, and uh this was sort of true uh but what happened typically was overtime and and in order to make our deadlines and in order to make the, the the tickets that were planned, um, we we went to overtime, and so um, in the period I worked there, and it's, it's about six months, um, I I've stayed like six seven times uh, during that period, um, and, and like how many sprints are there in a half a year? Like sixteen or something, and we offset that probably a little bit here and there. Like Christmas time was one, was one less, so. Half, let's say half the sprints I worked overtime, um, and a couple times we even stayed till like 10 p.m. Um, they gave us dinner, which was nice, but uh, that's not something I uh, I want in exchange for overtime because we didn't get paid more uh, because we were a startup, so there was tight budget. So now the question is, now that you know how a a, a typical schedule goes. Um, for for a, a, a startup that follows everything for Agile, um, you need to know how to deal with this. So this is what I learned in the companies I, that followed up here, like because the next company I worked for, I worked for over four years, and I liked it there. And we also did estimations there, and we also did scheduling and deadlines and everything. Uh, but we were a bit a little bit more loose with uh, with our deadlines, and also uh, as a, a retrospect for myself there. Like I, I asked myself, like, why were there deadlines? Like, why, why did we have to release this um, uh, after the sprint? And and this was a startup with their own product. They released an app update. Uh, it was a, a mobile application. <clears throat> they released an app update uh, every every two weeks because like following that schedule. Um, but no one was really asking for these features. Like there were wishes from the community. There were investors that wanted to see growth in users, but did they want a chat function? I don't know. Um, and no one knows. They were like the A-B testing was also done, but it was done after the sprint, not before the sprint, not investigating, do we really want this? But no, the feature was properly built. And after it was built and released, we look back at it in a couple of weeks and see if it performed well. And um, again, this caused a lot of stress for everyone. So first, how not to deal with them. Uh, so don't do overtime, don't stay quiet, and don't change your way of working, or do. Uh, sorry, double the negative here. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> you should not do overtime because overtimes do not fix estimations. Um, and, and, and I want to take keep, stick with this in your mind is when you do overtime, you do not fix the estimation. The estimation was wrong, and you should not have to stick to this. You should also talk to your manager because I think I have this here, right? Um, I'll, I'll get to that. Sorry. Uh, you should talk to your manager because or coworkers or 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 anyone really that is involved in this decision making. And you, if you don't have any impact on the first time, too, you should change your way of working. And Fitly also already touched upon this a little bit. So let's go. First, identify your problem. Who makes the estimations? Who decides on the deadlines? And who's in charge of changing these? So um, if you are the one to make the estimations and you have to do overtime because you don't make your estimations, then they were wrong. If your manager forces you to stick to your estimations, then, well, the logical conclusion is change your estimations to be a higher number. Um, but this is not, the, this is not the, the, the great outcome, but you need to identify who actually defines the estimation. Um, so who decides on the deadlines is usually your manager or usually the manager manager or a marketing team or anyone else that thinks it's a good time to release a certain feature. Um, 
And then you also need to identify who's going to be the person that can change that line. And usually it's the same person that defines it. Uh, but that's not always the case. <clears throat> so then you need to make changes. So first, talk to your manager as often as possible. Over communicate. Um, like there's no, no, you cannot talk too much to your manager about uh, issues that you are encountering on a daily day to day basis. If they get, if they are like, okay, you're talking too much, then then they also should realize that there is a lot of problems going on. So as soon as you like, you're working on a ticket and like. This is not out of the world, so you have a deadline, all right? You have estimations you need to stick to. So as soon as you had, uh, you're working on a ticket, and let's say this ticket was estimated for four hours, um, and you're working on it for two hours, and you notice I'm not even close to halfway. So at that point, when you notice this, talk to your manager. Don't wait for the four hours or five or six and tell to your manager, I'm doing overtime on this one. This doesn't work out. No, in, talk to your manager as soon as you notice this because you are the one liable for your own estimations. <clears throat> and so also communicate the wrong estimations there. So when you're working on ticket A and you notice, okay, ticket B is sort of related, um, but it's probably also gonna take me more time, then do this as well. If ticket B turns out to be part of ticket A and therefore ticket B is less time, also communicate this because communication is key in, in understanding. Um, and then you need to talk to your coworkers, see how they feel. Um, and this helped me massively there. Uh, I understood that uh, everyone felt the same way uh, and everyone um, had issues with the estimations and overtime. <clears throat> so yeah. Um, a summary here is, is avoid this at all costs, right? Don't do overtime. If you, if you, if you are in charge, don't do it. If you um, uh, have to do it, make sure you expand your estimations. And then also don't complete the tickets too fast if you are forced to do overtime. If you don't, because then you show you're wrongly estimating them longer. So you're like if you're forced in this situation, where you have to do this, then make sure your estimations are higher and make sure you complete your work about the time you estimate. Uh, and while at the same time, you influence your coworkers to do the same thing and you start the, the, the job search because you don't wanna be stuck in a company where you have to estimate double time and then you can be bored to make sure that you can do this, right? Um, and of course, you need to improve yourself. Uh, you always need to look at like, where did I estimate wrong? Did I do this on purpose? Like for manager reasons? Um, um, or did I do it accidentally? Like, did I notice that I have a hard time with integrating a certain aspect? So um, if you are always having issues with um, third-party libraries, then you know that if you need to do something with a third-party library in the future, um, make sure you estimate a little extra time there. And so, yeah, learn from your mistakes and, 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 and keep on improving these estimations because there's no way around them usually. Uh, the only thing you can do is make sure you are getting better at them and make sure you're communicating well. Um, and then let's talk about deadlines. Uh, you need to understand why they exist because um, they do exist. Um, and, um, and usually for the wrong reasons, but they, when they are there, you need to understand them uh, to know how you can influence them. So if it's your manager that needs to know, then there's a higher chance of influ influencing these deadlines than when it's uh, a government contract to get back into a subject. Like you can, there's a lot of uh, changes here. And if you cannot um, change the deadline, then you can maybe change the scope. So um, do we really need all the features that we've listed or is it good enough to remove one um, or simplify a certain feature to make that deadline? So um, instead of having a, uh, like I mentioned before, a chat functionality, maybe just providing some sort of email functionality is easier. Um, chat is usually like uh, 
uh, uses sockets and it, it up to date and it reflects quicker and maybe a message box is easier to build for you um, in some way or maybe just exposing email addresses also does a trick like do we really need it uh, and that can uh, that can help there and as I said add extra time to your estimations uh, if you have to do this um, this gives you your own flexibility um, so about me because this is this was my talk and I want to quickly expose what I do as I said, I'm a developer advocate. Uh, what we do is we do IoT device managing, management, uh, monitoring, uh, updating software on the fly, like all the things that you have issues with. If you have a Raspberry Pi, you know all the drills, uh, removing the SD card and everything. And we can just handle this all for you starting for free. And I can give you a coupon for $250 on paid products. So uh, free to start is like three devices forever. So you never have to pay. Um, so if you're ever interested in this, make a screenshot and then uh, or watch recording or whatever, um, or contact me, I can help you out. I wanna give you all the tools you need to make your work easier so you can make those headlines. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Renee, for just being transparent about your personal experience and also um, sharing practical things that, that you have learned. I think it makes it pretty easy for us to relate to apply in our own careers. Okay, so now we have another Q&A time. I feel free to keep putting questions in the Q&A. Um, we already got some that I, I see. Um, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as our time allows. Okay. Um, I just want to stress, Renee. The, the point that there is no over communicating that was seriously just great talk to your manager guys and girls they want to know about the problems as soon as the problems arise yeah exactly um uh, this is, I, I i still make that same mistake i don't communicate enough but it honestly just talk to your manager 10 times a day he won't even notice great all right so the first question is from Daphne Shen, um, both Vitaly and Renee mentioned the marketing team being a source of stress for unrealistic deadlines. What are some ways marketing and product, including engineering team, can work together to come up with more manageable estimations? Um, it doesn't have a name attached to it, so any of us want, any of you want to um, answer, please do. May I? Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there is this common misconception or strange pattern where teams depend too much on each other. It's easy for marketing to market what's done. So if I, being a marketing person, let's say, have this headset at hand, I can market it properly. I can explain the pros and cons of it. I can find the audience, the target audience for the headset to buy it. I know how to sell it. If it's not done yet, if it's just a prospect, it is even harder for me to market it. So if marketing team only markets what is already done, they can plan campaigns, they can do freely whatever they want. And the IT can help the marketing team with feature toggles. So if I am a marketing person and I want to launch a campaign for the Saint uh, Valentine's Day, let's say, I can have IT team done the feature maybe five, five months ago, and I can enable this feature only on the 14th of September, sorry, of February. So it's, it's easy peasy for me to enable things which are done and to market them properly. And I can run the campaign even on the TV. So once again, if you decouple marketing and IT so that marketing only uses what's already done or can even enable certain features when they want, it's much easier and there is no stress in this collaboration between teams. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Renee, do you want to add anything onto that? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, that's, I, I also say, I think that's the ideal situation there. Um, like um, typically you have to, like in my, in my experience, like with a company I worked for, uh, there were marketing efforts in place for features that, that didn't exist. Um, and and like what, what you need to do is you need to like make real sure you can actually do these things right because there is going to be a, a point where either you or your manager is going to talk to marketing to discuss this feature 
and it, it can also be a product owner like any any decision making person um and that person needs to be armed with all the information they can have so this boils down to over communication again is make sure you have communicated how difficult this issue can be and also make sure to add extra time uh, to estimations and to deadlines because there's always going to be issues um, by uh, by making estimations. Mm -hmm. I cannot agree more here. It's in project management. It's called uh, risk management, I think, where you line, where you just align all the risks and see what might happen and think of them. Or you can just double the estimate, and that's that's the safer option. Like one example, I want to give is. Um, uh, if you ask someone to 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 dig a hole, right, a meter deep, meter wide, um, how long is that going to take? And no one can answer that uh, because no one knows what's on the ground. Yeah. So there could be roots, there could be rocks, there could be solid bedrock, uh, mm -hmm. or there could be just loose sand and you're done in five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be everything of the above. Uh, so if you want to make sure you have enough time, then just estimate the worst case. Uh, and assume everything goes wrong and then then use that as a deadline. Mm -hmm. Or if you are planning, let's say, to build a proper house, so you need to dig a hole, you need to put some concrete on in, inside this hole. So there is this investigation phase where you actually spend effort on reducing the risk of failing the estimate. So you spend effort on understanding the feature properly, on building the skeleton of it, or building the API, even with the mocks, like building something in advance to reduce the risk of failing the estimate. That's what I personally do when I have marketing teams saying, we must do something on that date. So I'm, I'm telling them, okay, guys, we can do that. But in order, to, in order for me to tell you, like with a better guarantee, with a better assurance um, that it will be done, I need to spend a week now with my team. Cool, and um, thanks for answering that. Uh, we have one question for Renee specifically. Uh, it is, how do you convince the product manager if he or she thinks that the task is overestimated? Um, oh, that's a good one. Um, I would say track record, um, because um, this isn't probably not the first task you've done uh, and the first task you estimated. Um, and if if that person says, well, this one is overestimated, then just look back at your history and see how well you've done. Um, um, ideally, you should not have to convince them, but of course, the situation occurs. Um, so uh, look at that and, and, and otherwise explain your thought process. So explain why you think this ticket takes longer than that person thinks. Like what complexities are there? Is it technical debt? Is it um, uncertainties? Um, like it could be you estimate higher because you don't know certain aspects. Uh, so this is also part of the preparation phase. Um, and, and then you can give the responsibility to, to, the, to the product manager to make sure those uncertainties go away. And otherwise you stick with the estimate. All right, thank I you. Add a minor thing here. It's okay to not know things. Mm -hmm. As soon as you explain that, I don't know this part of a technology, let's say, or maybe this templating language or something else it's more visible for your manager what the risks are. So don't blindly say, yeah, it's fine, I'll figure it out. You won't, it's hard. People don't, under our problem is that we don't understand how much time, how much we don't know, how much time it will take us to understand that. So it's hard. It's better to say, I don't know something. After all, it's the manager's duty to actually help you to learn things. Okay. Um, so because of time, um, let's, let's wrap up the event. Um, I know we, we didn't get to everyone's questions. So, you know, feel free to leave them in the discussion section of the event page. Um, the, uh, my colleague will put the link in the chat uh, if you need that again. Um, yeah, and just to some, some final words. Um, Vitaly, do you have any final thoughts you want to add or share with everybody? My final words are always pretty much the same. Think 
why you are doing something before mm. you actually do something. <laughs> it's pretty much everywhere. It's, it's useful pretty much everywhere from a technological choice. Whenever you want to choose something, think why, what problem you're doing, what problem you're trying to solve. Will this tool solve this problem? Same about the processes. Like will over time solve anything? Pretty much none of the time it will, et cetera. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, great advice. Um, and Renee, what about you? Anything you'd like to add or share at the end? Um, yeah, I mean, never do overtime. Um, you're, not, <laughs> you're, you're not getting paid for it, typically. And uh, uh -huh. you're solving someone else's problem. And <clears throat> it's your time and your head. And if you do overtime frequently, you might even burn out. So uh, think of yourself. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining the event today. And also, you know, huge thank you to, to our speakers, Vitaly and Renee, and for taking the time to share with us. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed this talk. I hope it was helpful. And as you can see, uh, my colleague has put up, the next week's event is React with TypeScript, build a React component together. And as the name suggests, there will be a live coding time. Um, you can use the QR code for the event page or look for the link in the chat. Um, yeah, that's all. And thank you everyone. See you all soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you, girls. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.